Just before I wrote that letter to the newspaper, a columnist for the national McClure's Magazine had referred to Green Bay as that horrid little place. I determined that we should correct his impression. Not that he was all wrong, unfortunately. We had a corrupt city council at the turn of the century. Some officials were lining their pockets rather than seeing to the upkeep of streets and utilities. Mayor Taylor conducted a thorough house cleaning, though. Half the council was indicted, triggering a national scandal. And the city you enjoy today emerged. When Green Bay turned 50 in 1904, many of my fellow citizens feared the city was doomed without the lumber industry. Personally, I saw a location, natural resources, and a hearty workforce that, well, in my opinion, guaranteed a thriving community for generations. The Hospital Sisters of the Third Order of St. Francis opened Green Bay's first permanent hospital, St. Vincent, in 1888. It was housed in an older home on the south side, but soon moved to new facilities on the present Webster and Poor Lear site. A few years later, in 1900, the Sisters of Misericordia built St. Mary's Hospital on South Webster, just four blocks from St. Vincent. Our little community grew quite sophisticated in its second 50 years. The Wilner Building was centered around Washington Street. This became our tallest building in 1901, six stories high, and some said six feet wide. Dr. John Minahan built one just a little taller 10 years later. Thanks to Andrew Carnegie, we opened a fine library in 1903. The Green Bay City Band was formed that same year. In 1904, Green Bay installed cast iron gas mains to feed the city's nine streetlights. The new city hall building was just two years old, and there were three bridges serving the consolidated community on Walnut Street, Mason Street, and Main Street. By the time John Holberg had opened his steam-operated paper mill in Green Bay, I had already turned my fleet of tugboats from towing lumber rafts to hauling pulp for the new industry in town. The business of making paper conversion equipment began to grow as well. Alex Anna organized our first symphony orchestra in 1914. We took up the work of the Red Cross during World War I and easily exceeded our quota for membership fees and producing knitted goods. Then in 1915, another doctor, Julius Bellin, was a partner in the construction of this just a little taller yet structure, Kitty Corner from the Minahan. Those two doctors brought much more than modern architecture to our city. They laid the foundation for Green Bay's role as the health care center of Northeast Wisconsin. And in 1915, two young newspaper men from Michigan came to town and merged the struggling free press with the equally troubled Gazette. I started Green Bay Paper and Fiber Company, and a fellow named Coffrin introduced Fort Howard Paper Company in 1919. Coffrin had been laid off by Northern a year earlier and decided to show his old bosses what papermaking was all about. When it was time for me to go back for my second year at Notre Dame in 1919, I had a job here with the Indian Packing Company. Making $250 a month, what did I need with college? Well, football. I'd been a star at Green Bay East for four years and did well as freshman fullback under Newt Rockney. I loved the game and wanted to keep on playing. Why don't we get up a team in Green Bay? I'll take care of the publicity for you. Mr. Calhoun was as good as his word, and together we fielded a town team that won 10 games and lost just one in 1919. My boss at the packing company bought our jerseys and let us practice on a field that belonged to the company. So we called ourselves the Packers. After that season, my boss bought us a franchise in what became the National Football League, and I started recruiting good players from wherever I could find them. Passing the hat, even gate receipts, couldn't keep up with the bills. So Cal got some of our businessmen together with his boss, Andy Turnbull of the Press Gazette. In 1923, they started a nonprofit corporation that charged $5 per share and paid no dividends. The Roaring Twenties were years of prosperity and growth for Green Bay. The population grew during the decade from just over 31,000 to 37,400 
and there was lots of construction. That was about the same time we changed from gas to electric streetlights. By 1923, Green Bay was the world's leading producer of toilet tissue, with a daily output that would girdle the equator twice. Paper making worked in Green Bay because producers could have all the pulp they needed shipped in cheaply by boat. It didn't take long for other industries to realize the value of our wonderful harbor, one of the finest on the Great Lakes. And by the mid-1920s, Green Bay was a national distribution hub. In the 1920s, Dr. Minahan became the first surgeon to move a living human heart, setting the stage for today's open heart surgery. Dr. Bellin started the General Hospital in downtown Green Bay in 1908 and then founded the Deaconess Hospital a few years later on South Webster Avenue. After it was expanded in 1925, the name was changed to Bellin, despite the objections of the doctor. Railroading even topped papermaking as our economic leader. First, there was coal shipped by rail from Appalachian mines to ports along Lake Erie and then to Green Bay by freighter. From here, three railroads and later trucks took it downstate and throughout Minnesota and the Dakotas. Then gasoline and petroleum were shipped in and Standard Oil established a distribution center here. East High School was dedicated in 1924. In 1925, a new YMCA home was completed. And so was the Columbus Community Club, housing the city's first civic auditorium. The biggest addition to community culture, though, was the new Neville Public Museum, finished in 1927. Mr. Neville, a lawyer, business tycoon, and history buff, had been mayor from 1888 to 1890. Mrs. Neville was active with the Public Library and County Historical Society all her life. West High School was dedicated in 1928. The carefree years came to a sudden stop on a warm October day in 1929. The bottom fell out of the stock market. The Great Depression left much of the country dazed, including workers and farmers in our area. But Green Bay never saw bread lines or soup kitchens. The financially healthy paper mills slowed but never closed and kept the city's economy going. As one local put it, people always need toilet paper. The Green Bay Football Corporation kept us playing until we hit a snag during the Depression. Then, the Green Bay Packers, Inc., with the same rules, took over and still runs the franchise today. By 1934, Green Bay had 62 manufacturing plants and 70 wholesale houses. 1934, by the way, was the height of the Great Depression. But while most of the country was in the economic doldrums, we held a huge celebration of the 300th anniversary of Nicolay's Landing. Green Bay had a hundred different industries, all going strong. In addition to paper making, we were the world's largest cheese producer and shipping center, had the largest pickle factory in the world, shipped six million pounds of fish every year, and were the biggest wholesale and jobbing center north of Milwaukee. Among our local heroes was John Rose Sr. of Kellogg Citizens National Bank. He bought up many farm mortgages at a discount and refused to foreclose until the debtors had an opportunity to repay their loans. Sooner or later, most did. This man became a hero too, a few years later in World War II. The second Brown County resident killed after Pearl Harbor, he was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross in 1942. Like everyone else in the U.S. during the war years, Green Bay people dutifully endured rationing, travel restrictions, and the terrible loss of friends and loved ones in battle. Our biggest military hero was Air Ace Jimmy Flatley, who received the Distinguished Flying Cross and later rose to Vice Admiral in the Navy, the highest rank any of our citizens ever attained. Regardless of rank, our veterans came home from the conflict, ready to move on with their lives in Green Bay. For many, that meant fall Sundays with their beloved Packers. I thought we'd pick up after the war right where we left off, world champions. But winning games seemed hard to come by. In 1949, we won only two, and I couldn't seem to do anything about it. I met one last time with the executive committee and then, by mutual agreement, resigned. As I left town to coach the Chicago Cardinals in 1950, I figured the name Lambeau would never again be associated with the Green Bay Packers. There were ups and downs over the next few years, but when Green Bay turned 100 years old on February 27, 1954, 
manufacturing and retail sales were at an all-time high. We were selling locally made products all over the world. And the only purpose of my presence on this program today is to make After nine years on the city council and ten as mayor, I had just been elected to the Packers Board of Directors when Curley left. When I decided to step down in 55 after five terms as mayor, I saw there was still a lot to do for the Green Bay of tomorrow. We also needed a new stadium for our dear Packers. The old one behind East High School only held 25,000 and it was falling apart. But so was the team. We hadn't had a winning season since the war. I would have been more optimistic, of course, if I'd known then about our upcoming rendezvous with a relatively unknown coach on the staff of the New York Giants, a guy named Lombardi. Lombardi.